Hello everyone, in this video we're going to be talking about the hydrohalogenation of alkenes. It's one of the addition reactions that alkenes undergo. If I take in a general reaction or a generic example, suppose I have an ethene. So the structure of ethene would look like this. And I'm going to go ahead and write down the hydrogens, even though you don't have to write down the hydrogens, but I'm going to go ahead and write down the hydrogens for the sake of seeing uh, what's happening to the incoming species in there. So I'm going to be adding a binary acid, so it's going to be some sort of HX, so I'm going to change the color there. And remember, your X could be anything here. It could be in a chlorine, a bromine, or iodine. Um, so when we're adding these hydrogen and the halogen here, it's going to be going on to those vinylic positions. So you have two vinylic positions on this particular uh, alkene. We got uh, one right there and the second one right there. I can go ahead and call these number one, call this number two. So when I'm making the product at the end of the day, so I suppose I'm still going to have, you know, other two hydrogens that were already there on each of those carbons. And then now we're going to have an hydrogen and halogen coming in and that they are going to be added onto this uh, vinylic position. So I can have one of these carbons getting the hydrogen like this and the other carbon getting the halogen like this. So that's just the addition, typical addition reaction. And obviously, we didn't really have any rigid chemistry there because uh, both of those carbons were actually the same that were bearing the double bond because we got two hydrogens on both of them. But now, let's suppose you run into a, a actual typical condition where your alkene is not symmetrical. Like in this case, it was an asymmetrical alkene, but you don't have an asymmetrical alkene. Then you gotta really worry about which carbon is gonna get the hydrogen and which carbon is gonna get the halogen. So let's uh, take an example of maybe in a butene, and I'm gonna take this butene as my example, one butene there. So when I'm adding, suppose HCl in this particular case. Um, I got two carbons that's obviously bearing the double bond, one and two, so those are your vinylic carbons, and the question is which carbon is going to get the hydrogen and which carbon is going to get the chlorine. And There is an easier way to memorize it, and I'll tell you a little bit later on why that actually really happens. Uh, the easier way to memorize it is whichever carbon has more hydrogens in the beginning will get the electrophile or the hydrogen that's coming in from this binary acid. So when I'm looking at this first carbon, I got two hydrogens on it, and your second carbon is going to have only one hydrogen on it. So what I'm going to be doing here, I'm going to be adding this incoming hydrogen or an electrophile from this binary acid onto the first carbon because it already has more hydrogens to begin with. This particular addition is going to be called a Markovnikov's addition. So remember the rule, uh, Markovnikov's rules, where it says the electrophile or the hydrogen gets connected to the carbon atom that already has more hydrogens attached in the beginning. So I can go ahead and write down the two hydrogens there, and obviously I'm going to go ahead and write down the third hydrogen there that's on the second carbon. Now I'm going to say, okay, the hydrogen is going to come down here, and your chlorine is going to come down here. I haven't really talked about the stereochemistry. This is more like an origin selectivity of this, uh, these hydrohalogenation reactions. So typically they do Markovnikov's rule whenever you're adding a binary acid onto these alkenes. You can, however, do an anti Markovnikov's addition as well, so I'll talk about that in a minute. I do want to redraw this because you may not see all the hydrogens kind of being added in there uh, just because you don't show the hydrogens in the skeletal structure. So instead, you may see your final answer just like this right there. So just a chlorine on there, and the first, hyd first carbon has already gotten the hydrogen, but you don't really have to draw it out. So be aware of both ways of writing it. So then 
Um, obviously, your skeleton form where you're not showing the hydrogen is going to be the most common way of writing it. You could also do anti-Marconicops addition as well, but there has to be some special conditions for that to happen. So if I go ahead and take maybe the same example there, and uh, for anti-Marconicops addition to happen, uh, it typically works with HBR. And in addition to having an HBR only, you could you also need peroxide, something like H2O2 being written or R, OOR being written. So in that particular case, uh, it's going to be the opposite where your electrophile or the hydrogen gets connected to the carbon that actually has less hydrogen attached to it. So in this particular case, uh, this new, uh, this incoming electrophile or the hydrogen that we got here, it's going to be actually going on to this second carbon and your bromine which is this right there is going to be coming down onto the first carbon so that's what makes it a anti-marconicops rule so let me just go and draw out how the pro uh, product is going to look like so i'm not really going to show the hydrogen because you got to get in that get in the habit of uh, seeing the hydrogens uh, on the skeleton structure in your mind but you don't have to necessarily draw those so your bromine is actually going to be right there so these addition of uh, hydrohalogenations to uh, addition of these binary acids to these alkenes is going to be region selected so you could get two different types of uh, constitutional isomers so depending on which uh, what particular chemicals you're using along with it. So typically it's always going to be more common unless you're using some sort of ROR, ROR or H2O2. So if you're not using that it's just going to be more common cops rule. So remember you can also do uh, instead of using HCl the typical you can also do HBr or HI as well so keep those in mind as well however your anti marconicops rule is going to work with HBr only so when we talk about the stereochemistry and the mechanism so your stereochemistry kind of goes along with the mechanism so that's why I want to talk about those both together and I'm only going to be talking about the Markovnikov's addition. Your anti Markovnikov's addition is going to be a different mechanism, and uh, you may not see that uh, until you start talking about radical reactions. So that's going to be for a different day. But here we're going to be focusing on only the Markovnikov's addition. So let's suppose what's happening. Let's figure out what's, uh, what's happening here. So I'm going to go ahead and take these hydrogens out because that's just not uh, going to be important. So your first step when we adding the binary acid, so suppose I'm still using the HCl, it's going to be your nucleophilic attack on that hydrogen. So your nucleophile in the double bond is going to be the pi bond, obviously. So you're going to have uh, this attacking here. And in the process, the hydrogen chlorine bond is going to break and it's going to go on to the chlorine like this. So then the question is, you could have hydrogen gone to the first uh, carbon or you could have the hydrogen gone to the second carbon. I can go ahead and drop both of those and I'll tell you why it goes on to the first one because we already know according to the Marconi cost rule that it's going to go on to the first one. So if it does go on to the first one, suppose, and I can, I can probably go ahead and uh, write that down here. You don't necessarily have to write that down here, but let's say I go ahead and write that down here. What happened to the second carbon now? So this second carbon originally had four bonds, but now it does not have four bonds and it becomes an electron deficient, so it gets a positive charge here. So that's doing with Markovnikov's addition, but if you don't do it that way, so I'm just going to go ahead and write that down maybe on the bottom here. So if I don't do it that way, but instead add the hydrogen onto the second carbon, so I'm going to have the extra hydrogen added here, so maybe I can change the color there. So I got this extra hydrogen added onto the second carbon. Then what happened to your carbon number one? Well, that's going to become electron deficient and it's going to be a making a carbocation here. So what's the difference in terms of these carbocations? Well, we got a primary carbocation in the bottom here 
And when we go with Markovnikov's rule, we get in the secondary uh, carbocation. So you know secondary carbocation is more stable than the primary carbocation. So that's why you don't make primary carbocations in this particular case. And these reactions reduce selectively will be going according to the Markovnikov's rule. So once you go ahead and make this, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and redraw this. And uh, I'm going to be drawing it without the carbon. Gonna, uh, without the hydrogen, so I'm going to take out the hydrogen because that's just not necessary. So then your second step is going to be the addition of your nucleophile, which is obviously going to be the Cl- minus that you have created in the first step. So you have two steps going on here. That was your first step, and that would have been your second step. So let's just go back, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and write down here that it's not stable. So it's not going to be observed. So when I'm looking at this uh, carbocation that you have made, so remember in the carbocation carbon, your uh, hybridization is going to be sp2, where you have this uh, unhybridized p orbital here, something like this. And this unhybridized p orbital, which is going to be empty, so this could be attacked by this incoming nucleophile from the top, or it could attack from the bottom. So either way is going to be fine. So it can attack the top lobe of this unhybridized p orbital or the bottom lobe of this unhybridized p orbital. And as a result, you have the possibility of having this chlorine that's going to be your nucleophile either coming out of the page or it's going to be going back into the page so i could have this coming out of the page cl or i could also have this going back into the page now you really have to worry about this if the center that you are about to create is a chiral center if that carbon is not chiral center you don't have to worry too much about the stereochemistry in that case so you do make uh, both of these enantiomers in that particular case. And then in addition to that, uh, let me see if I have another example. Remember, you, anytime you make a carbocation, always be on the lookout for carbocation rearrangements. In this particular case, you had made the secondary carbocation, so there wasn't really any possibilities of doing any rearrangements because you weren't really making any tertiary carbocations, but suppose uh, uh, you know, suppose I get this particular alkene here and I'm running this very similar reaction here. So suppose I got an HI here. So at the end of the day, when you do your first step, so I'm just going to go ahead and break a bond here. So this attacks here first, that comes out. So you're going to be making a secondary carbocation initially. And always be on the look for if there is a possibility of doing the carbocation rearrangements. So before I do the nucleophilic attack, there is actually going to be a carbocation rearrangement by doing a 1-2 hydride shift. That's because if I can move the positive charge onto this position, it would be more stable because that's going to be your tertiary carbocation. So what I'm doing here, I'm moving one of these hydrogens down onto this location here. So that's why it's a 1-2 hydride shift. And as a result, I'm going to be making this new carbocation that's going to be tertiary now. And now I'm going to be taking that and then doing a nucleophilic attack on it. Now worry about if this is going to be creating a chiral center. Turns out that this carbon that's having the positive charge is not chiral anymore because you got two methyl groups on to the same carbons. So it doesn't really matter whether you do a top a lobe attack or a bottom lobe attack, it's still going to be making the same product because it's not chiral. So you don't really have to worry too much about the stereochemistry in this case. You only worry about the stereochemistry if the given carbon is going to be chiral. All right, so this is what it's going to look like as your end product. So always be on the lookout for your carbocation rearrangements as well anytime you're making these uh, carbocations as your intermediates. All right, if you have any questions, feel free to leave any comments in the section below.